Uh, Kevin Kabad, good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. How are you keeping? Good. The big guns are in studio this morning. The what, sorry? The big guns are in studio this morning. Oh, yeah, exactly. The, the, the big players. <laughs> Fourth broadcaster of the year and all. There we go. Thanks, Kev. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Where do I want you to tell me? Where you want to start? I don't know. There's been so much talk in the last uh, 24, what, 36 hours, whatever it's been since the game. I don't know, it's just ultimate disappointment, wasn't it, from the end? Because we, we had a crack at doing something special on, on Tuesday evening. So it has to be all about the Denmark game now, and hopefully we keep everybody fit ahead of that. You're copping a bit of heat. Ah, Jesus, come on. I, I may be funny, Nike. You, you, you say one thing you say one thing, and you get a bit of stick. I, it, 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 it was a basic error. That's all it was that the lad made that, that cost us the goal, or, or led to the goal, should I say. It didn't necessarily cost us directly, but indirectly it did. It's a sort of little things, basic things you need to you need to learn as a kid. The, you know, if if the ball goes dead from a throw in, you attach yourself onto the deep line cent centre midfield player, stop him getting on the ball. It wasn't as if it was a quick throw in that was taken. The ball goes out of play, and there's a, a, a you know a, the, the ball's thrown back in quickly. There was there was more than enough time for one or the other, either Collins or Conley, to get themselves into position. Con Collins is actually in position to force the ball backwards. That's what it is. The, the amount of thing that makes it—it's it, it, quite—it's—it's um, it's quite an easy thing, really, when 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 you, when you're learning the game to, to do that sort of basic basic thing right. But that was it. It was yeah. again, it's something that you learn as a kid. That's that's all it is. It's no big deal. Like but I'm sure it's something that Mick looks at when you look at finer detail in games. I was watching it back yesterday, and obviously, um, watch watch back to with your comments in mind to try and find that nuance in it. Like it did look like a harsh comment to me from because like even though right we lost the ball at that point, and I appreciate your point, he could have been in a slightly different position. But in terms of the concession of the goal, like we had plenty of time to be well set. No, no, that that was my point. Though I said other things led to it as well, though, Adrian. But what it is. You, you keep you keep everybody behind the ball. I, it, it was, I, that's what I'm saying. There, it wasn't as if it was a quick throwing that they took quickly. Yes, James McLean put the ball out of play, and yes, there was other things that happened after it. But it, it, it was it was something that you look at minor detail in game. That look, you get everyone behind the ball as quickly as possible. You switch on as soon as the ball goes dead. You, you're not you're not playing. You know, we're not playing for fun now. It's one of those things where this is this is this is a big moment in the game where if if he locks on quickly, if he, if he switches on quickly, it wasn't as if he needed to sprint. All he needed to do was jog back into position. But the position, but the position wasn't taken quick enough, and they broke out. In fairness, it, it, it's it, it's kind of a minor thing, but it's a little minor detail that managers and coaches look at that lead to goals, and that's what happened. Look, a, a large part of, I guess, the uh, backlash, as you'll have seen, no doubt, when you went online, was because it was singling out Aaron Connolly and you touched the other players who were involved in the several mistakes in and around that goal. And like one of them was James McLean kicking the ball out of play, as seems to be a consistent factor. And like James McLean has played, what, probably heading for 70 times for his country now. Like, when James McLean is still doing things like that and giving away possession cheaply and not, and not looking to involve the midfield at times, like, is he somebody whose position we should be looking at as well ahead of that Denmark game? Yeah, but that, Nate, Nate, Nate right, OK. That, I, I'll, I'll take your point on it. Of course, nobody wants to kick the ball out of play. But you could see what he was trying. He's actually trying to turn the defence to try and put Conley in quick, a quick foot kick. It didn't go right because he mishit the ball. That, that's what happened. You're not defending it, but that, that's, that's what happened. He, he made a mistake. Conley made a mistake by not switching back on into position. Jeff Hendrick, or whoever it was, made the mistake by not making the challenge. But all these little things led to the goal. That's what happened. Um, James McLean has been struggling for a while now, has he, in an Irish shirt? Of course he has. I think everyone can recognise that. He's not been producing the form that we maybe saw two or three seasons ago. And he's not really... He's not providing that spark, and, and I think he'll know that himself. He doesn't need, he doesn't need to watch that game back to, to see that that was a mishit pass that went out of play that led to the goal. But that's that's the sort of thing that's that's costing us at the moment. That's why we're not playing well. We're playing within ourselves. There's a nervousness, there's an edginess around the team, and that's ultimately why we we are probably in the position where we're actually we're having to go and chase the game against Denmark a little bit now when. We could have made it easy for ourselves if we'd have got the right result probably in Georgia. That nervousness, that edginess that's around the team, is that not exactly what Mick McCarthy was meant to get rid of? That a year into the job, that the impact he would have on these players in the dressing room, the, the, the way he could, the, the mindset he brings, just the general boost he would bring, that, like, is it any better than 
it was a year ago? Um, well, the, the two performances, probably not. I think there was, there was, there was certain um, spells in the game um, in the second half against Switzerland, I felt, where there was a little bit of positivity. There was, some actually, there was actually some decent play in the game, which we hadn't really seen across, uh, across the game in Georgia. We look well organised. That's the one thing I would say. But I think as a defence, we've always looked we've always looked well organised because we're not going to be we're not going to be too dislodged in the game. But if you're looking for, a, are we seeing a vastly improved performance from a year ago? I'd say no. Of course, we're not. But you don't need me to say that. You know that you, you know the answer to that yourself, Nathan. You, you, you've seen enough of the team. In terms of nervousness, that's been around the team. I would say probably for ten years. I think we got the initial. First under Mick when, Mick, when Mick came in, the Georgia games and things like this, where we actually, you know, it, it was positive at home. You're coming away from the game looking for a bit more. Even the Switzerland game at home, the last 15 minutes, you're coming away from the game when you've got that buzz again for an international. But ultimately, it was always going to be judged on these last few games, particularly these last two games. The Georgia game was a disappointment, I think, because I, I, I don't think they're as good a side as, as perhaps they have been. And I think there's a real chance to go to Georgia and get a win. But it was always going to come down to these last two games, Switzerland away, which we never got going. But Mick, Mick's probably right in the fact is that that game was not probably going to define us. It was always probably going to come down to that last game against Denmark anyway. And there is a chance, of course there's a chance. But the more that we build up the negativity around it, the more that we build up that, you know, he can't do this, he can't do that, that affects the psyche of the players, no matter what anyone says. That we're, we're all talking constantly about how a certain player can't do this. The players have got to maybe stand up and be counting now. They've got to try and block out what you, I, and what everybody else are talking about, what they're reading, what they're listening to, because I guarantee that's, that's one of the major factors that's affecting the team. And, and as much as we don't want to say that, look, or we want to comment on the, on the, on the performances and say, yes, we're, we're commenting on individuals or commenting on the team itself, we're, we're, we're probably we're probably affecting what's, what's going on. And, we, and, and that's, I, mean, I, I referenced yesterday what, what Ronald Gara was saying to you, Nathan, about if the team's not playing well, they read more, they hear more. And that's ultimately what's happening now. And players are playing well within themselves and we're not seeing performances from players at all, no. Yeah, like in some ways, Kev, the, when you talk about, like we're talking now about the last 10 years, right, like in terms of Irish performances and the range of managers we've had over that time, some of whom themselves would have been driving that, a lot of that negativity, it strikes me as well. But like if things haven't changed greatly over that time, and we've obviously had at various points the calls to get rid of Trapp, the calls to get rid of Martin O'Neill, and obviously we know the situation with Mick McCarthy, but if things haven't changed greatly in that regard, right, and they haven't, I think we can all accept that looking at the game the other night. What's the way out of this? Like, are we, we're surely kidding ourselves to think that if Stephen Kenny comes in, he's going to suddenly wave a magic wand and things are going to get better. Well, I, I, I think there'll be, the, 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 at, least, at least there is um, a process in place going forward where we've got, we've got a manager coming in that's going to take over and with the hope that I would think, if and when Stephen Kenny takes over, that we are going to have a manager in place for a couple of campaigns, that he's going to be given time to implement his style to, to try to gain confidence of, to gain the confidence of the players so they have the trust in him that his methods are actually going to take the team forward and I have the belief that that's going to be the case um, I'm, not, I'm not judging it from two or three under 21 performances although he's got a kick out of those 21 uh, players I mean we've, we've got a good crop of 21 players it is I think we all know that they've come through from, from the underage system with Tom Moore and the other coaches that they've worked with so we've got we've got we've got a manager that's going to be coming in that will, I feel, will probably try to will try to change. I'm not saying there's going to be a magic wand that's going to change everything around overnight, and I don't think it's going to be overnight. I think that we might be sat here in a year's time with a few results gone against us, and we might be thinking is it the right decision. And hopefully, hopefully that there is trust from the, the powers within the FAI where they think, well, look, don't listen to the outside fact here that we have to actually look at a manager here, i.e. Stephen Kenny, that's going to change a system that's going to actually try to implement something for a number of years rather than just a short-term fix and, and, uh, and, a, and a quick fix to qualify for the next campaign because that's what Mick is. Mick's a short-term fix, get the job done, hopefully, and we all hope that Mick does that job, gets us to the Euros next summer, and... Um, and then w with the bounce that we're going to get from those Euros, that Stephen Kenny can take the team forward, that's the only thing that we can look at now. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be the case next year, actually, now with Stephen Kenny. I know Mick McCarthy touched on it, that he's been fortunate with the way things have worked out, Stephen Kenny, perhaps. And I think that's right, because... So, 
a year ago when the discussion was around Stephen Kenny, it was, look, we always have to qualify. First and foremost, we have to qualify. You know, style of play in that conversation is great, but we have to qualify. Mm. I actually think Irish football fans have got to the stage of that when Kenny comes in, there will be a bit more yeah. patience because... We're not qualifying we're playing, anyway. <laughs> we're, exactly, we're playing it but, no, shocking. No, sorry, the, but the, F, the FBI are not in a position, though, really financially to be saying we, can't sac we can sacrifice qualifying for major tournaments. Well, we're sacrificing possibly qualifying for this tournament. No, no, I know. I mean, I, I think supporters, and I think we, we all would love to say, well, Stephen Kenny's got, got, got X amount of campaigns to, to implement a style that's going to be beneficial for us in 15, 20 years' time. But financially, the FBI is still going to be looking at, we need to qualify. We have to qualify. And that, that, that's the danger, and that's the worry that we, we would all have, that we go back to a, a system where it's all about qualifying for a major tournament when we have to actually look at because the development of the team has suffered because of that that, that is what we all recognize now we're recognizing that that's where we are Right, we'll be coming back to this one again, absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, 20 to 9 on this Friday morning, we're chatting to Kevin Cabar. We're going to talk a little bit about, because yourself and Nathan are off to uh, Old Trafford, obviously on Sunday, half past four kick-off, live and exclusive commentary of Manchester United against Liverpool in the Premier League. Uh, we were just debating at the top of the show, uh, Kev, but how, what sort of approach United were going to have here? We couldn't settle on anything that was uh, going to get anything, obviously, uh, for them out of the game. I presume, I mean, a temptation to sit back, Nathan thinks maybe not, sit deep. Well, I think we're going to probably, we'll, we'll hear Ole Gunnar Sol Solskjaer's um, press conference today. And I'm sure that the, the comments will be along the lines of, we're Man United, we go out to win, we, we go out to attack, we go to do the right things. And, but can, can you see Man United going up against Liverpool and saying, right, we're going to go and beat you, we'll go toe-to-toe, we'll, -to -toe, -to -toe, we, we'll squeeze high, we'll go and press you, no chance. Um, have they got players in the side that can play a counter-attacking way? Probably yes. You got to get a actually a wrong playing counter-attacking way but it was still progressive it was still it was still actually exciting to watch when he first got the job I think that's the way that he will go I think he's got no other option but to do that and it'll be tried to contain it'll be tried to use the pace of certain players whether that'll be Rashford or one or two others that's going to try and hit Liverpool on the counter-attack because I can't see them hurting Liverpool if they have possession of the ball and try and dominate with, uh, with, with possession it's also hard to see the other way working because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is not Jose Mourinho who can set a side up defensively and frustrate the life out of you. And like the result people maybe look at from a counter-attacking point of view for United is the win at Spurs last year at Wembley where Marcus Rashford and Jesse Lingard caused absolute havoc. But like that wasn't a Mourinho-style counter-attacking performance either. Spurs battered them in that game. They missed chance after chance. David De Gea produced an out-of-this-world performance. And they were hanging on, and they got lucky, essentially. It's just hard to see, Kevin. Like, Do you think Solskjaer has it tactically that if they set up defensively, that it's not just putting seven, eight men behind the ball, that they have an actual game plan that works out a way of maybe stopping the supply to Firmino and keeping yeah. the two full-backs out of the game? Like, have you seen enough from Solskjaer that tactically he can come up with a game plan that will not just be luck, but will actually be, you know what, he got that spot on and frustrated the life out of Liverpool. Well, I mean, he's got, he's got enough experience around him with the coaches in Mike Field and people like this as well that have, that have coached at, at that level that have actually got the best out of some of the, the, the greatest United sides. But, but the, the, the methods of Solskjaer from what, what he says openly in press conferences and things is it's always that, well, what I said earlier on, we're Man United. We, we will impose ourselves, our will. But United don't have the players to do that anymore. United are not the side that they were when, when, they, could, when they could have done that to sides, when they could have opened teams up, go and out, power them out, run them. And in fairness, in what, from what you're asking there, no, I've not, I've not seen, well, I've not seen him do it against West Ham or, you know, Everton last season. Everton, like, smashed them towards the back end of last season. So... If I'm looking at maybe this season as well and how he's setting up sides against some of the lesser teams, he's not necessarily paying attention to some of their key players or some of the key players in opposition teams. So he's going to have to do it this weekend. He's going to have to stop supply line. Fullbacks are the main supply line. I think I, think I was seeing yesterday um, Alexander-Arnold and uh, Robertson have, got, have, have provided more crosses than any other players in the Premier League this season. That is Man United, uh, sorry, Liverpool's main supply line. How are you going to stop them? Are you going to actually almost go the wide players, you're going to sacrifice the attacking element of your game to, to get back and, and, and track back with, uh, with Alexander-Arnold and, and Robertson. I don't know if United have got, got even the players to do that. So that's the worry that, that I wouldn't say tactic. Tactically is a bit harsh when you start saying you, you manage your 
got the uh, the manager tactically astute to do that. I don't think United have got the legs in midfield to compete with Liverpool. I don't think they've got the legs in wide areas to compete with the attacking fullbacks, and certainly haven't got the legs at the back to uh, to stop um, Liverpool's attacking players. I think Liverpool have just got way too much for them all over the pitch. And talk to us about Liverpool. Like the obviously they have United now. They have Spurs upcoming. They have City next month. They've already done away with the likes of Arsenal and Chelsea. Like they're looking really impressive. Are we potentially looking at here? I mean, a bit of misfortune notwithstanding. Potentially looking at here at Arsenal Invincibles style run. Do they have that in them? I'd probably say no, judging from what we've seen from Man City in the last few years. We, we, we got 15 games or so in with Man City over the last couple of seasons and we thought, we, thought, we thought it could be an invincible season. I don't think so. I think they probably will slip up. History suggests that that's going to be the case. And Liverpool, for all that they have looked so impressive this season, they've grabbed out, they've grinded out wins when necessary. I don't think that they've actually looked particularly comfortable in spells at the back. I think they have looked a little bit vulnerable, particularly in spells maybe where Trent Alexander-Arnold hasn't particularly got his position right and they've looked vulnerable when crosses have gone into, into the area. So there are still vulnerabilities, but I don't, think, I don't think the invincible season, I think that's probably going to be beyond them. The defensive problems often with Liverpool, that can be put down to the midfield as well. And it sort of seems to be this constant rotation that Jurgen Klopp has in midfield, never really settles on a on a three and like Fabinho I guess was brought in and has been the deepest player trying to add a little bit of protection for that midfield like, has his role changed this season or something that they do look a little bit more exposed at the back uh, I, I've not necessarily seen that I, I, I'm sure that's not been the message but um, but I, I think with Liverpool I think they have to change the midfield though Nathan as well I think that you know the energy that, that, that they consume every single game, the, the, out, the output in, in those players, it's phenomenal. I think that Klopp has probably recognised the fact is that they've not got players that's going to be able to control the game. They're not, they're not going to have midfield players that's seriously going to go and dictate games in the really big matches. It's going to be outpowering them and outrunning them. So he's recognised that he's got to keep certain players fresh. And I mean, in terms of Fabinho, Fabinho, he, he has been excellent since he's come in. Certainly maybe after his first four or five games when he came into Liverpool, and he looked a little bit shaky at the, first, at, at the start. He didn't move the ball quick enough. He, he probably wasn't up to speed with Premier League and maybe even Liverpool's way of playing. But he's quickly learnt that. And I, I don't, I, I've, I've not necessarily seen him play a different role, but I think you found him in more advanced positions this season, I'd, I'd feel as though. You, you maybe find him in positions where he started attacks and maybe vacated the, the, the real central position at times. But... No, I don't, I don't necessarily see a different role with him, uh, within the side for him. I just think maybe Liverpool have, have had to rotate that midfield so they've not necessarily got a settled run of midfield. You can kind of know with City. If City have got the, the, the three midfielders fit, they're going to play those three midfielders. What, one change out the three, well, Liverpool could make two, they could make three in certain games because of the energy, as I said, that the, the clock recognises that that midfield used every week. 2-0 Liverpool? 0-0. 2-0. 2-0. 2-0. 2-0. I think Liverpool win comfortably enough, yeah. Um, I think I, I think Liverpool might even score early in the game. It might force Man United out. I think we could we could even see more. Liverpool have been vulnerable at the back, so United may score on the day, but I think I think Liverpool will definitely score two or three goals, yeah. Good, right. Listen, stay off your social media feed. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you've got to take, you've got to take it on the chin, haven't you? It's just it's, when, you, when you get copied in on tweets and you've got a, you've got a thousand messages a day, there you go. No, I might more, more the abuse about dancing and ice, but I mean, like, <laughs> you know. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, there you no, go. No, no, I so think I think I think you know, Kev. Twitter, Twitter, bad. Instagram, good for you. Is that right? He is a social media expert, Kev. So I, I thought you were. Yeah, we, we, we must follow up on that conversation. Remember, you got Kevin, to use social media manager. Kevin agreed that I was going to be a social media manager once dancing and ice starts. Yeah, we, we agreed that over a couple of pints, though, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. I quickly realised that Nathan Murphy running my Instagram account wouldn't be a good thing. <laughs> good luck.